Maybe. <laughs> Yeah, I earned bonus points one time when I started my last job at the law firm, and I showed up at a meeting to give a presentation to like 100 board members across 10 offices, and uh, of course, PowerPoint went down, and I had printed notes, and they were like, wow, and afterward, people stopped me in the hallway for weeks. They were like, wow, you continued on. I'm like, yeah, I continue on. How are you guys not prepared for this? <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, so thanks. We'll move forward, I guess. Um, I'm Brian McCann. I am a certified knowledge manager. I'm also a librarian. Um, I spend a lot of time working with uh, collections and connections. So we house a lot of stuff, and I help people to get to that stuff when they need it, is the short version of what, we, what I do, um, whatever that looks like. Um, today we're going to talk about knowledge retention. This is a uh, problem that basically every business faces sooner or later because of this thing where time passes in our universe. Things will change over time, and when they do, you got to be ready. So generally we think of it as uh, retaining knowledge when people leave the firm. They leave and their knowledge goes with them, and we would like to know how they still did their jobs after they're gone. Um, but I'd encourage you to think a little broader than that. It's not just when people leave completely, but leave temporarily. Say you take maternity or paternity leave, and you've got to hand off your jobs for a few months. Okay, you should have documentation and a way to make that easy. Let's say that you had to take care of a relative who got sick. Maybe even it's even just taking them to chemo one day a week. That's 20% of your workload if you have documentation you could hand off to somebody, which would be great. The way we're going to uh, get a handle on that is with really cute dogs. So let's go ahead to the next slide. Because you got that. Maybe. These are Baxter and Spencer which is either the name of a law firm or a show coming to the CW in the fall. Uh, Baxter is on the left. He is, oh gosh, this is what I have notes. Um, he is a dachshund. He's about seven years old. He likes barking and sleeping in chairs. Uh, the larger, thank you, is uh, Spencer. He's a basset mix. He's 12 years old. He likes barking and sleeping on couches because he's bigger. Uh, now, up until recently, my daughter was in charge of feeding and caring for both of these dogs. Last fall, the inevitable happened. She went to college. So we had to pass off those skills to somebody else, to my son, right? Um, but she was the only one who knew how to feed them both because they're both different ages, they have different diets. The smaller dog does not eat as much food. So my son, Ben, had seen her feed them but didn't get like the measurements, who gets what, how many times a day. Um, so my daughter, Sophie, she wrote the instructions all down for them, <coughs> hand them off. Uh, my son, Ben, looked at this uh, list of the, the schedule that she'd made. Um, it didn't exactly work with his schedule because he attends robotics club after school. So he can't feed them at three o'clock if he's fixing robots till six, like an awesome person. So he had to make some modifications. Then when he, uh, so he made his own list for how he would feed the dogs. And now uh, he, and he wrote some of that down. It's on the fridge. So if he's ever out for a prolonged robotics tournament, they're awesome if you haven't gotten to go to one. They're like Tony Stark Expos, but with teenagers. That's beautiful. Um, and now we have that knowledge around for all of us on the fridge. What they did in sharing that knowledge around from Sophie to Ben about how to feed the dogs make sure we get the right direction, is they followed this knowledge management practice, the SECI model, also known as the, oh God, it's small, the Nonana Takuchi model. Uh, they're the ones who came up with this. If you want to take pictures, please do, but you can actually just Google SECI model, get full descriptions on Wikipedia. There's lots of versions of this graphic. Uh, there are some that are like little, literally line drawings. Anyway, Find them, take a picture. This is not the end all be all. It's not behind a pay wall. You can get out there. This is where I'm going more in my notes. Um, this basically covers four stages. It starts in the upper left uh, with socialization and moves clockwise around. You'll see on the outside, there are words tacit and explicit a little bit. Tacit knowledge, explicit knowledge. Tacit is knowledge that we keep inside that doesn't get out. Explicit knowledge is stuff that's out there, right? That's been made explicit. Think of, if you're a musician like me, think of explicit lyrics that get a label. And if you're a percussionist like me, 
I will give you a hug later. Um, uh, concert percussion is we get tacit on our music a lot. We don't play. Uh, it's just be quiet while the horns do the important things. That's fine. Here's the stages. It takes some interpretation. Socialization. This is where knowledge is shared by proximity or by observation. Usually it's just by being physically close to somebody. You're socially close to them and that's how you learn. My son had seen my daughter feed the dogs, but she never actually told him how to feed the dogs, right? You just kind of, you pick up some information um, and along the way. Externalization is when you take that knowledge that's inside of you and put it outside of you. That's when my daughter wrote down instructions and had it available. For work situations, this could be a video, it could be screenshots, it could be whatever, but it's getting that information outside of a person. Combination is the stage where you take that document and you put it alongside other stuff, right? This is where my son compared it, that schedule to his robotic schedule and said, okay, this will or will not work. We're gonna come back to it, but this is the place where in a work setting, we have all the most to gain, I think. You adapt information. And then this last stage, internalization, is where uh, you make the job your own. You follow your own instructions and you might make some additional tweaks. My son, fun fact, solid foot taller than my daughter, okay? Even though he's younger by several years, which means he can put stuff on a higher shelf if he wants to, for example. He can find that as he goes. Um, so as we go and do things, we can make adjustments. In the center of this graphic, there's another spiral to indicate the passing of time. These are bases that we cover and we cover again. This is to account for things like the future, that time passes. So this is not a one and done process. It's more of a mindset that you begin. Um, if you're into sci-fi, it's sort of like entering a temple loop. Uh, you go through the same time loop again, but this time you retain the knowledge from before and you get to have more stuff going forward to solve your situation. Yes, I watch Star Trek all the time. Um, so, at work, what does this mean? Uh, it means for socialization, somebody watches you do your job. Externalization, you tell somebody how to do your job. Connect uh, the third one, a combination, they adapt how to do the job. And then internalization, they do the job. Then we get back to stage one, where somebody watches them do the job, not you. So a lot of the value I see for this is in the combination part, because we can put instructions for a process next to other things. This really gives us a chance to rethink the how and why of what we do. So often we, for example, run reports or scans uh, that people may not need anymore, or if they want them in a different manner. I got a new boss last year who wanted to get our reference stats in a whole different format. So we worked through that. Um, and it was a good chance to have documentation for it. Um, it's also a good time to say, you know, I wrote this report and I sent it to somebody, but let me ask them, maybe that report should go to somebody else. Maybe that job function was transferred to a different person. And it helps, it helps you be more efficient and make sure that uh, the value in what you're doing is always consistent. So just remember that things will change over time. You know, our dogs will age. They might need medicine of different kinds when they get older. Um, platforms that we use will go to new versions, software will need upgrades, vendors will get sold or go out of business, people will leave or change jobs. So having this sort of process in place um, really helps us when those things inevitably happen. So um, I think, let me check for time. I could do that. Oh, nice. So I encourage us to think of this for knowledge retention for two main things, for two main reasons. One is when people leave the company, when they retire or go somewhere else. I've spoken with a number of IT directors, more than I would have expected, who said that the biggest threat to their information security is a bus. Namely, them getting hit by one. Because all that information they have lives inside of them. And if they get hit by a bus, nobody has that, and they have to flounder and dig and try to find that information elsewhere which is a little unsettling. Um, but I would say knowledge retention is, again, more than that. It's not just when people uh, leave the company or get hit by a bus. Please don't, I mean, please, I'm not saying that out into the universe, don't get hit by a bus. I love my IT director, he's awesome. Um, but it's also when people 
change roles or go to a different department. Consider that if you were given a promotion or moved to a different department, if there was a task no one else knew how to do, that task could move with you. So yeah, you've got this promotion, but you also have to keep doing your old work. That's not a new job, that's more job. You don't want that. You want to keep the, keep the instructions with the key roles rather than with the key people. And having this sort of process helps distinguish those out so it's not just stuck with you. Um, and also just because I live with information all the time and how people handle it, uh, please remember that knowledge retention is not binary. It's not a thing that you do or don't do. Knowledge is already being retained uh, to some extent when people leave your company or whatever, um, but it's retained really badly. You know, um, new employees need to find things out for themselves often, which takes time. They might ask people for help, which takes those other people's times. Um, whew, I had a person who on my team who retired a couple years ago. She'd been there for about 20 some years. And we asked her to write, write down some records for the new person. She wrote a physical binder in print. Honest to God, the print on the page was this tall. <laughs> and like, okay, this, and it's limited to that binder, so we couldn't transfer it anywhere else. And it's like, okay, we gotta, oh, please let us work on this. So, knowledge retention is happening, but it's happening inefficiently. And this sort of process helps you handle it well, easily, seamlessly. So, here's the part where you say to me, Brian, this sounds great, but unfortunately, it also sounds like work. So what does this take to get this done? Good question. A lot of us have a lot of work to do. And if you're like me, you know, I'm doing my job and doing a, stopping to do a process like this and document work feels like I'm not doing my job. I'm documenting about it. So it does take some time to start this process and write things down, warn how to do that in a bit. But I will say that it's less work than floundering for a year after the IT boss is hit by a bus or after several people in the department choose to retire in the same few months. Um, yeah, it takes some time and effort and it's worth it. I also consider part of my job uh, ensuring that information is stored well and that it's accessible to other people. So even if you don't get hit by a bus, you could win a cruise around the world, you could take maternity or paternity leave, uh, things happen, time passes, and it's good to be ready for that now instead of scrambling when it suddenly is thrust upon you. Um, I also note that this process is front heavy a lot. So once you do the groundwork, it gets so much easier after that. Revising content is a lot easier than making content. So this practice will build momentum over time, um, and it's a loop and a spiral because it just keeps going and it gets easier the more you go. I'm going to move into... Okay. We're almost ready. If you want to get started, there's going to be time for questions. If you want to get started with this process, um, how would you get implemented? I would consider a big picture and a small picture approach. Let's get back to the cute dogs. The big picture approach is the big dog. It's bigger dog. He's still not really big. Um, first, look at your company's core values or their strategic goals. Um, knowledge management really professes looking at what your company says it wants to do overall and time uh, efforts into that as much as possible. Most companies value things like uh, sustainability or efficiency. So go to your C-suite and say, hey, I saw that you in our goals that you want to be uh, sustainable and efficient with things. Here's a way we can be efficient so that we don't have to uh, retrain people so much. Whenever people leave or retire, we can actually streamline our roles. It's hard for them to say no when you're giving them what they want. General, I find that it works really well for us. Uh, the smaller, more granular picture, smaller dog. Um, if you want to make sure things, are, things get done, uh, standard practice for the knowledge management recommends as a field is to tie it into people's performance evaluations. You know, people do what they have to do, we do what we get paid to do. And so wiring it into that makes a certain amount of sense. In the same way that you have, you know, other duties as assigned, maybe have a line like, you know, maintain documentation regarding key tasks. Um, oh, sorry, that was, per, that was chapter description. Um, put that there. <laughs> so yeah, uh, what this means is, if you tie into the performance evaluation, the people who currently work for you, it puts it on their radar. And it says, this is a thing we're serious about. We're gonna be talking to you about this once a year. How you embody that is up to you. It could be a checkbox. Did you work on this project this year? Yep, true, okay. 
Um, it could be a five-star rating of, you know, whatever. It could be pick five tasks that you do and create documentation. Okay. Um, and then the next year, do five other tasks. And did you revise these? Okay. There's a lot, a lot of ways you can do that. It depends on your company size and culture and all that. Up to you. But that's for people who currently are on board. Add it to your job descriptions and then new people you hire, it's on their radar from day one. So when they enter, it's on their job description, it's on the performance eval, and they get it going forward and it's in the works. So spend, you know, maybe a year cycle doing that kind of work and then uh, you can add it to other things. I'm going to, I blurred through because we had tech issues. Um, that's largely my thing. This is a Q&A for you, thanks to our sponsors. Um, you can feel free to contact me at this really small email address. Or, um, on most social medias, I'm writer Brarian because I also write books. It's a thing that I do. Um, and you can find me there, which if you want to email me, I'm happy to do that further. Are there any questions that you might have or things you want to look into for us? <laughs> Or it can be awesome. That's <laughs> fine. Christy, was anything you need for me? Yep. You're good. Okay, cool. Then thanks for your time. Um, have a good day and keep practice for what you do. Big round of applause.